By the time this video ends, I will be in the dark. That's how much time I have to finish this video. Today we're going over a classic, a classic that is not often covered. One would say Garry Kasparov's most underrated game, but I'll just say for now that it's underrated and leave it to you to judge. Today you have the opportunity to witness Garry Kasparov at his ultimate prime. In this game in 1994, he is playing Vladimir Kramnik, one of Russia's greatest chess players of all time, and this is at the prime of Garry Kasparov and Vladimir Kramnik. Garry Kasparov has the white pieces in this game facing Vladimir Kramnik with black. Kasparov starts off the match with e4, and to c5 his opponent's response, he goes with knight c3, the closed Sicilian. And after his opponent goes knight c6, knight e2 is played to prepare d4. Knight f6 is played now, and now d4, going at the center, a typical push of the Sicilian defense. His opponent trades on d4, to which knight takes d4 is played, and now e5. This transposes to a type of Sicilian called the Lurental variation, or the Sveshnikov variation, depending on which order of moves. This is the Lurental variation. When knight db5 is played, d6 to stop the knight d6 threat. White uses this tempo to play bishop g5 to pin this knight, a very annoying pin, since black's plan later on in this game is to push for the center with f5. So keeping a pin now is not the worst thing you can do. His opponent kicks the knight, as I said, with a6, and after knight a3, a very typical thing in this variation is b5, threatening b4 the fork, which is not going to be happening, of course, in this game, because they're super GMs, but it is forcing the removal of one of these knights to escape this threat, right? So Gary goes with knight d5, pressuring this knight on f6, and ultimately, after b bishop e7, a development move and stopping this pin, there is a nice bishop takes f6. So Gary here, really typically again in this variation, trades off the bishop pair for a weird bishop on f6. The key here is to keep this bad bishop, dark square bishop, behind this, bond, this pawn structure so that the black pieces remain in this bind, in this really serious passiveness. And so Gary goes with c3. So c3 is not like just your typical push. Yes, it takes up both these squares of the knight and really plays against this knight on c6, but it does so much more than that. It gives a nice square on c2 for this knight to recycle itself on c2, e3, and then even regenerate itself on d5. And after castles, knight c2 is played promptly. Rook b8 sees some future pushes like b4 happening, and after h4, a super clever move, and today is a go-to in this variation, because it takes up the g5 square. You see, this black bishop wants to go to g5 to take up this long diagonal in order to remove itself from this f5 push. But now that h4 is played, by the way, sacrificing a pawn, if bishop takes h4, queen h5 is played, and here black loses on the spot, because if you move the bishop away, we have checkmate. And so black would just lose a piece after g5 defending the bishop, and then just g3 pressing, doubling down on this attack. So that is not possible, and after h4, here we see Kramnik's first mistake. First and probably last mistake of this game. Knight e7 does not look like it's doing too much, but it gives the opportunity for knight takes f6, g takes f6, doubling black's pawns and weakening this king on g8. And after queen d2 eyeing the h6 square, I prefer the white pieces because we could see the emergence of a rook on d1 and straight up attacking this backwards pawn on d6. Bishop b7 is seen, and after the development move bishop d3, we can see some presence of pieces directed x-raying the king side right here. d5, e takes d5, and queen takes. Here black's plan is very obvious. I love it too. Black are opening up the center because they're seeing a weakness in the white position. The king is still in the center after 17 moves, and black wants to open up the position 
to hinder on these weaknesses and ultimately get as much as they can, maybe e4, maybe queen takes g2, while the king is in the center and these rooks aren't aren't connected. So after queen d5, this king is weary and we see castling by Kasparov, which is a really big surprise move because it kind of donates to charity the pawn on a2 for free. Though Kramnik doesn't play that yet because if queen takes a2 here, there's a really striking rook h3 with some good attacking chances on this king. So e4 is played at first instead and after the forced bishop e2 pretty much, I mean bishop f1 is just retro, going back to the 1920s rev. And after queen takes a2, here Garry Kasparov needs to find some active counterplay, and so Garry Kasparov goes with this queen h6, attacking f6, and finally some active play from the white pieces. Long time no see since move 10 or 12. And after the queen goes back to e6 to defend this f6 pawn, now Gary strikes again. Knight d4 attacking the queen, bringing on another piece in the attack, getting that initiative, attacking a piece, a very valuable piece, and forcing another queen move. Rook h3 is now played. This is one of my favorite moves of the game, super underrated move. This is called a rook lift in chess. It is a very strong idea in which white does not have time to bring other pieces in the attack and instead just brings a rook, a full rook, which doesn't usually see the middle game and just usually waits out till the end game. And now the rook can strive in this center and really actually be a concrete attacking piece. Rook g3 check is threatened and if you don't block this we have H. If you block, we have h5, and if you don't block this, we have queen g7 once the king is tucked away on h8, and that would be checkmate, so these are real threats. Black has to prophylactically get their king off the g-file because then, otherwise, the rook goes on g3 and it's winning, right? But bishop g4 is played here. Very interesting move. I would definitely comment that the fact that this bishop is not active, bringing it to to g4 for probable bishop f5, or even taking over this f5 square for knight f5 ideas seems pretty reasonable. Rook g8 is played, and after knight e6, which appears to be a mistake, but only if black plays exact. But otherwise, this knight e6 is kind of interesting, because here you are intercepting, interfering shall I say, the queen to the defense of the f6 pawn. And so you cannot take this knight on account of a very beautiful combination. Queen takes f6 check, which forces the rook to go to g7, and now rook d7. And here black are useless. They don't have enough supplies to defend this knight on e7. And if you try rook e8 to defend, now I just have bishop h5. And again, here the black pieces just collapse. You can't block here because I have checkmate, so there's also a pin on the knight this way. So you can't take this knight, but can you do something else defensively? Yes. Kramnik finds rook g6, attacking the queen first hand, which is an in-between move, and after the queen moves, now you deal with this knight. By the way, you still can't take this knight here on account of queen takes b8 check. So your rook is attacked. So after rook e8, now Gary comes in with a third piece. We saw the queen come in on tempo, we saw the knight come in on tempo with knight d4 attacking this queen, and now we see the rook come in on tempo with rook d6, bringing a new piece into the attack and attacking a valuable piece. Very nice move. And after knight d5, a shocking move by black here, yes, the, the queen moves are very tough to find. I mean, super limited amount of queen moves, and let me tell you, they're not pretty. On queen a7, a7 the queen is completely out of play. And here we have h5, and it's really impossible for this rook to continue defending this f6 pawn. Despite our knight hanging since two moves ago, this rook would fall as well, and so this would be just completely over here. If knight takes, we just have checkmate in a few moves with bishop takes e6. Rook takes, and then we would have the back rank for checkmate in a couple of moves. And so it's really hard to play this, and now Black goes in with knight d5. Knight d5 striking in this center. Knight d5 attacks the queen, a desperado move you could say. Once your queen is attacked, you attack another piece to keep in the game. And from here on out, Garry Kasparov finds the rest of the game. 
That's right. Gary Kasparov Prime calculated so well and so far, you could just tell they had seen this force variation from maybe three, four, five moves ago. Pause the video to solve the problem if you think you can find what Gary Kasparov now finds for the next eight moves. In this position, he goes with the earth shattering h5. Sacrificing a queen, sacrificing a knight, while your rook is en prise. Black does not have many options. The main move is to take the queen, that is what's forced. If you don't take the queen, let's say you take the knight instead, here we can still sacrifice the queen by playing h takes g6. And now we are threatening some really winning attacking moves. Let's say that you play queen takes d6. It's already checkmate here because I have rook takes h7, king g8, not even taking this queen by the way you guys, rook h8 check, forcing king takes. If the king goes up, we have checkmate. And so after takes queen h6 check, king g8, and then after king F f8, it's completely over. Queen f7 buries the hatchet. So here, if you take the queen, now we have rook takes h7, king to g8, and now we would take the queen. And here, white is up in exchange, so this is not a possible variation for black. So after h5, it is pretty forced. You need to take the queen. And so now Gary Kasparov proceeds for the next few moves without a queen. You do not take this queen because after rook takes g4 attacking this knight several times, by the way, if you just take on f4, I'll just take back and after takes, it's a pretty winning endgame for black on account of this passed pawn on e4. And so, okay, how do you deal with this now? Well, rook takes g4, if you take the bishop now, I just take this knight with a full piece up. So instead of taking the queen here, Gary Kasparov goes with h takes g6, sacrificing the rook on d6, the knight on e6 by pawn, and just going absolute mayhem. Here you are threatening the queen. So the queen must move pretty much. And that's what's so beautiful about this variation, is that if this queen just moves about, Rook takes h7 here, king g8, and now we take here on f7 with a fork. The king has to take, and then we would take here with the queen, and you have nothing with your queen on f2 to checkmate me as the black pieces. You can't do anything. Let's say you try knight <laughs> d3 check. I'm not going to respond with the king move. I'm simply going to sacrifice my rook on this, because if you take back, I just have checkmate in a couple moves, with queen f7 and queen g7 checkmate. So it's really hard to defend here. You can't make any shortcuts. And so black took this rook here, and I just want to point out to you that in this position, white are down a full queen. A full queen. And so white has to play this move. If you don't play this move, it's completely over. Rook takes h7 check. The king is forced to g8, and now g takes f7. Another forcing move that forks these two pieces and forces the king to take the rook. At this point in the game, white are down a queen and a rook, but not for long, because now we take the, we take the rook and we make a queen. Absolute W promotion. Insane material game move. And now, Black has to play accurately again, because we're threatening mate in two moves as white. And there's not many things that you can do, because this knight is so strong on e6. I just want to point it out. You can't defend however you want because of this knight. It's just such a strong piece, and it's a catalyst to ultimately this checkmate coming in. So knight takes e6 is pretty forced. You gotta take that knight off the board. And okay, if I just take this knight, well then you just trade, and this is equal, right? Four pawns, four pawns. Same colored bishop, pretty equal. So here, Gary found this little detail that makes this combination, this entire combination that you've seen since h5, work. And that is bishop f5. The very minute difference of this is that when, okay, you can't blunder checkmate in one, let's just all be clear. If you, when you go king g7, here we have not taking this knight that's free for all of us, but queen g6 check. 
forcing the king to get off of the defense of this pawn and don't blunder mate again. Oh, don't blunder your queen. Don't blunder mate again. We have queen h7. So king f8 here would would just be met with queen takes f6, which was played in this game. And this does not just win a pawn, you're winning the knight too. And so now we are a pawn up. And this is such a crucial pawn that after bishop takes e6, I would like to venture a guess that Vladimir Kravnik was so psychologically deterred from the events that just happened from move 27 to now move 35. And that's why I believe this next move is the complete blunder. Queen f8 has been played here to try to force a queen trade and ultimately grasp at the chance of a draw. But here, Gary Kasparov plays so insanely good and so precisely good that you just can not even fathom bishop d7 locks this game in a safety vault. Bishop d7 forces this king to deflect its defense off the queen and is now deflected off of the e8 square, forced to take this bishop, which would give the queen in turn. And in this position, after bishop d7, Vladimir Kramnik gave his hand in 1994. And look at that, it's still not dark yet. I still have a little, a little tiny bit of non-darkness. The sun is setting on Amsterdam and the video is ending as we finish the day. Thank you so much for watching, sending you a ton of love. Please like the video and see you soon.